Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, I have got my candle lit. I burned Palo Santo. Where did I lose? I lost my oil. Here's my oil. So I'm like buzzing because I'm really excited to share this with you. And the thing that like I want to start this with is that I'm going to share with you tools that I have discovered on this 13 year journey. And I want you to think of it as exactly that, just tools that you can integrate right now today. Um, and then also that you can integrate, you know, um, to come like later on and stuff. And so I'm really excited to share this with you. It's really been coming together like lightning in the last month. And so um, I'm, I'm like, literally, I'm just like, I'm so excited. And so I haven't been doing, to be honest with you, a lot of spiritual practices lately, um, because I kind of wanted to put that stuff on a shelf. Cause I felt like a little bit of it was pulling me away from reality too much. Um, but really, and truly we are bringing spiritual practices into the physical body in a very practical way. So I thought I'd light my candle, get my Palo Santo, get my essential oils before we jump in. And so, um, Darlene, I know you're here live and thank you so much for being here live. Um, so <laughs> as you can see, like, I really like, oh, I'm going to get emotional. Like I, I really want to deliver this stuff because this has been, um, a lifetime lifetimes of work come together. And so this is a very spiritual thing for me right now to bring so many different things together and, um, give you an overview of the spiritual concepts that are really talking about the mind body identity and then the body to reality experience and truly all of the power is within us and so i'm going to share with you some practices that are going to help you feel that power um before we get into this um i'll just let you know that the replay is going to be up on youtube um I may, I, I'm, I'm going to take the replay down off of Facebook when this is done. I just wanted to stream it to Facebook in case anybody was like kind of interested, but didn't want to like fully commit. Cause sometimes it feels weird to like sign up for stuff that you're not quite sure about. And so this will come off of Facebook when we're done because we're going to be workshopping with Darlene. And then, um, depending on how personal it gets with Darlene, I may just actually stop the Facebook stream. Um, because the workshopping stuff is not going to be out there for everybody. It's a bonus for being here live. Um, so that's probably what will happen. We'll just stop the live stream. So oh, we're going to get into this. Oh, I just blew out the candle with my exhale. <laughs> okay, there we go. Well, we'll put that away. So before we get started into this, I just want you to start to really feel your end result, like how you want to feel in your body how you want to feel with it, with a sense of ease. Like I remember the first time I didn't have tension in my shoulders, I was driving and I was like, this is what it feels like to feel good in your body. Oh my God. So whatever discomfort that you might have in your body, really try to put yourself into that experience of what you would be doing if you didn't have that discomfort. And then also what you would be feeling like and what you would be doing if you had your ultimate dream body. My ultimate dream body was always ripped and athletic and looked like a superhero. I never had any intention of being skinny. I just wanted to see muscle. And so that's my dream body. And my health dream body was to not have the tension and be able to eat whatever I want without feeling like my butt was going to fall out of my body. Um, the inflammation was really bad and it would put a lot of pressure on my rectum and then ultimately have um, a really severe stomach ache and then hemorrhoids. So for me, it was just like no tension, eat whatever I want, feel healthy, and then be super muscular and athletic. That was my dream. And I'm there and I just keep going and I have backslides some, you know, sometimes and nothing's perfect. Um, but, um, I want that for you. And it's been 13 years for me to get here since I started this journey. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that I did in that initial 13 years, but then also I'm going to share with you stuff that I've learned since then so that you can accelerate your experience. So it won't take you 13 years to get as far as I've, as I've come with like all the things that I've studied and stuff. So for the purposes of Facebook, in case there is anybody that's like watching on the down low, I can't press play on the presentation. So we're going to see all those slides there, but that's better because that'll help me stay on track. 
So welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so what we're going to cover today is how the mind unites itself first so that you can use it to change your body, what the best exercises are for a strong and healthy body, what the best exercises are for cardiovascular health while preserving precious muscle. And I should say, I'm just going to type it in right here as I forgot. Um, when I, when I realized that I left it out, I was like, how did you leave this out? It was like one of the most important thing, what the best exercises are for, um, connecting with your light body. <laughs> and I'm like hesitating because I'm like, is it true? It's true. <laughs> and I'll explain to you how it's true. Okay. So that's included. And then also mindfulness practices, um, to listen to your body so that you can feed it just the right amount. So we're going to cover your mindset, your energetics, the function of how it all works together, and then what exercises will achieve different things for your goals. So we're also going to go into a little bit of attachment theory um, so that you can see what your patterns are with the food, with your food and your feelings so that you can flip them and use them to enhance follow through. And I feel like this is groundbreaking work. And any of my girlfriends who watch my stories and see me talking about attachment theory, they're like, oh my God, that's spot on when they've been using it for relationships and they see how I'm relating it to the food feelings and our sabotage, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. So once you see it, you can't unsee it. You'll keep seeing it more clearly, more clearly, more clearly. And then once you balance it within your body and the relationship with yourself, then you're actually going to see where it shows up in every category of life. It's amazing. Um, so then I'm also going to workshop with you. That's when we'll take the recording off and take us off of Facebook. And then we'll put the recording back on so that we have that on um, YouTube forever. Okay. We're going to do it. Okay. So the there's all these sp spiritual metaphors that are talking about hierogamic union. And you have the slides there. So I'm going to leave that up for, for here so that you can kind of have that reference, but I'm not necessarily just going to read the bullet points, but basically what I have found in all the books that I've read and all the spiritual practices and metaphors that are out there, we're really talking about the masculine and the feminine energetics within us. And it's in layers. So the first part is the conscious mind. And so we view that as the light, the going forth and the desire. And that the subconscious mind is the black behind, behind all of this light. It's the empty space. And in the metaphors, it's the empty womb of the mother where whatever you put into it, she will deliver it. And that is how the subconscious mind is working. And I'm going to explain it to you how it works with your body chemically and then how it works vibrationally with your reality. But the first thing that I want you to really grasp is that when we're talking about self-love and we're talking about hierogamic union, we're talking about that first, we have to get those thoughts and feelings together because the subconscious mind is the emotional center of the brain. This is where all of the feeling activity is that then is experienced in the body. And so it's our thoughts and feelings that have to be united first before we can actually get the body to start to change. And, um, and the other thing that I want you to think about is that we're in layers. It's first the thoughts and feelings that create the body. Once those thoughts and feelings are together, now we have the mind-body connection. When the mind-body is now mind-body, as if in one word, now it's that in relationship to the outside. And so if whatever we want to create with the outside of our body and whatever we want to create with the physical presence of the body has to first start with those thoughts and feelings, because that is where the power is. We have to get that union within because those thoughts and feelings your mental body, like there's an actual body, like a layer of it energetically, and your emotional body is a layer of it. And then you have your physical body. So we're literally pulling together the physical experience of the body and the metaphysical experience with the thoughts and feelings. And when this was like, you know, it's been a long journey for me to figure out how to say this in a small way, 
But this is how powerful it is. And this is why when you hear people talk about your thoughts and feelings have to match for things to work, it's because of this, because we're actually working interdimensionally because the conscious mind and the subconscious mind have their own light layers to them. So we're literally bringing our body parts together on the physical realm and the non-physical realm. And we're going to get into this deeper as the slides go on of how it works within the body and outside of the body. But for right now, if you could really imprint in your mind <laughs> that the conscious mind is the light that shines into the darkness, but it's not darkness as in anything bad or fearful. It's just like, what do you want? Like, it's like a flashlight looking around your subconscious mind of like, well, what do you want to feel? You know, it's like your baby dad. It's like the daddy. Like, what do you want? Like, do you want money? Like, I'll, you know, do you want a car? Like, what, like, what do you want? I'll give it to you. And so when we look at these, like, um, you know, funny stuff about a, a man woman relationship, a daddy relationship, um, the feminine that is the, is the one that, um, is the seductress to get the man to do whatever she wants. This is what we're talking about. The subconscious mind is the feminine energetics of desire and creativity and also giving forth. So let's talk about this a little bit from, um, from, from the, remember when I said in the beginning that I'm going to share with you the tools. So we have all these spiritual practices and ways that we might like to think about spirituality. That's different for each one of us. But this is like the tangible thing. Like if we're going to do a bicep curl, you're going to do it with a cable machine. You're going to do it with a barbell. You're going to do it with a dumbbell or you're going to do it on Pilates equipment, but it's still a bicep curl. So I'm teaching you what these things are and like whatever your spiritual practice and metaphor is of that beautiful experience, use that to go along with it. But this is the function of it. When I learned the function of this stuff, it allowed me to actually sink into the emotions and deal with them because up until that point of not understanding how it works, I really wasn't able to access this unification within me. So with the subconscious mind, this is the feeling mind and it's physical and it's non-physical. So we have um, a chemical center of the brain that secretes molecules of emotion that match the feeling experience of the emotion that we're in. And emotion is a measurement of energy. That's all it is. And for the physical experience, our human mind interprets that emotion to let us know what it means. So for some people, if you're raised by an alcoholic, this is like the like standard personal development, you know, reference. If you're raised by an alcoholic, for one child, the feeling of, of alcohol might mean, yes, go do it. This is how life works. But for another child, it might be, oh, no, that was a horrible experience growing up. That is not what I want to experience. So it's our own brain's interpretation of the experience of the emotion that we call the feeling. And that always has a molecule that matches it. And it always has a vibration that matches it. And the vibrations, we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, we don't want to go ahead, but we have those two elements of emotion. We have molecules and we have vibrations. Now, when we're looking at it from the molecular standpoint first, okay, this is from Dr. Bruce Lipton, who was like ousted from the university, like university community, when he was saying that your DNA goes both ways. It gets programmed through the RNA, and it also gets programmed, it goes through the RNA both ways, from the cellular environment and from the blueprint itself. So the molecules of emotion, this is how it ends up happening. The molecules of emotion secrete from your brain and then they fill your cells. So your cells are swimming in the feeling state of whatever emotion you are experiencing. And if it's a negative, painful emotion, 
those molecules of emotion are degenerative. So now we have degenerative molecules of emotion in our cells and they, the information gets transferred through the RNA, tells the DNA, this is life, this is how we should adapt, this is what it is. And then the DNA expresses itself through the RNA, through the cells into the physical experience. And so this was breaking the religious dogma of science, which is why he kind of branched off and might be even why he doesn't use Dr. Bruce Lipton on his Instagram handle, because maybe it was like too much of a controversy. Um, but there's lots of evidence that supports this. <laughs> so when we're looking at this from like the, what we're experiencing in our body, I learned from HeartMath Institute, um, and I'm just going to reference where I've learned stuff from so that if you want to look something up, you can, like I said, the replay is going to be up, whatever, like you can look up the references. So what I learned from HeartMath Institute, where I learned the brain and heart coherence breathing, where we connect the mind body through the emotional feeling of the heart, the slowing down of the breath and the thinking your positive thoughts. HeartMath Institute said Wherever you have degenerative molecules of emotion stored in your body, that's where you have the tissue breakdown. And we get these molecules stored in us when we stuff our feelings, when we don't deal with our emotions. So the molecules literally don't have a processing way to exit our body, and then they'll stay in different areas of the body. And when I learned this, I was like, oh, so. I can use Louise Hay's work to pinpoint where I have discomfort in my body, look up what the meaning is and the emotions that might be there, and then really go into meditation and be like, what do I have? What memories do I have that feel the way she's describing what shoulder pain is? And so I was like using all of this stuff as tools proactively to get rid of these emotions so that I could feel good in my body. The only thing that the way we get the degenerative molecules out of our body is when we do the inner work, when we actually face those emotions and you can do them. Like it, sometimes, you know, the thing that you're struggling with. So you have to like sit with yourself and go through the process of feeling it and forgiving it and making a new meaning out of it. But then also, if you're like me, like I was so far removed from my body that like I used all of these tools to actually go into it, to experience the emotions because I didn't have access to them. I repressed them so much that I had to like deconstruct it. Now, like I said, it's vibrational. <sighs> so there's metaphors also where the holy family of the trinity of having a divine masculine a divine feminine and then a divine child quote unquote of god is talking about the power that we have on the atomic level and when the first time that landed for me and i was like oh my god so then i started to look up all these different metaphors of a holy family and in my like spiritual friend community, I was the only one who was like going down the rabbit hole of a spiritual family. And my family was, you know, I, I had a divorced home and I don't really like the idea of family. A lot of times family get togethers make me anxious, even though I love my family. And I laughed when I was like, oh, this is how spirit is helping me heal. I understand this as a divine family within, and that's helping me ease the pain of feeling the disassociation from a family physically. So I was really excited about that. And I thought that was so beautiful. So the metaphor is that the thought is the proton. It's the positive subatomic part. The feeling is the electron, the negative subatomic part. And then our decision to do whatever we're going to do is the neutron. And I found this video on YouTube where it was explaining how when we make changes to our body, we become radioactive. 
So it kind of plays into like why we feel funny when we're making changes and why our reality starts to shift and like people who we haven't talked to in a long time come back or people that we are close with go away. What's happening is when we have an atom that has a whole lot of protons of masculine energy, which is the doing and achieving, and we are, found. and we're going to um, balance that with having more receiving and relaxing and self-care and self-love and less judgment, those electrons come in and it spits out the protons. When an atom is spitting out protons or electrons, it's radioactivity. So our vibration changes. Same thing if we are more in the quote unquote feminine energy where we're not pushing ourselves, and we're in the swamp of the divine feminine. We're like, my feelings, my feelings, I'm so sad. Like all of those types of things where like we're drowning. When we use that willpower, those neutrons, and we're like, no, I'm, I'm going to work out three days a week if it kills me. I'm going to be committed to working out three days a week. This is it. Like, I'm just going to commit for three days a week for six months, and, and that's going to be a great start for me. That's what I did. So then what happens is electrons get spit out, and those subatomic parts have more protons mind-blowing like we literally have the power within <laughs> oh my god um so Darlene I hope like if you have questions like you're writing them down for the workshop time I gotta I gotta get through this okay so um so here we have okay let me just go back really quick so we have those molecules of emotion I forgot a slide okay so what I had after this one I messed up is um, that the molecules of emotion and the expression of our DNA is that it slows the aging process. So I, I had another graphic and I guess I forgot to put it in of like baby to working woman with her purse and her heels, and then going back down into being older and going, you know, being on our way out. And so that's what happens on the chemical experience. It's really having us be revitalized because regenerative molecules of emotion are all of our growth hormones. We're not really dealing with cortisol. We're not really dealing with, um, with histamines. Our body literally gets um, uh, healthier. The vibrational aspect of it creating the body is that atomic structure. We are in a quantum field. We're in the dense form of it. All of it is sound. We're in the place where sound is so low and slow, it is materialized in something we can touch. But our physical body is manifested with these subatomic parts and how they're feeling is what we're really looking to experience in this manifestation. And when I was studying Dr. Bruce Lipton's work with meditation and chronic pain, he talked about how when we are worried about the future and we're regretting the past because it's thoughts and feelings, our atoms are actually being split apart. On that atomic level, parts of our body are living in an anxious future and a regretful, painful past. So then the thing that we have here in the now moment to experience is pulled apart. So when we do this inner work, we're actually getting ourselves all together on an atomic level. When that body is together on the atomic level, well, this is happening regardless, whether it's discombobulated or together, our vibration is what is coming out into the reality. So I have three points to share with you. Our willpower, that neutron being the divine child of God, and the dictionary says that God is just the, is the ultimate reality. That's all God is, the ultimate reality. God includes the pain and the pleasure. It's all one thing. So our willpower, it's like on this vibrational field that's like a wave, like it's literally like water. Like there is stuff in between uh, our faces and our computers right now. This is not empty. There's st stuff here. We just can't sense it. So our focus is like this laser light. So if you can envision that if you were underwater and you had a light on your head 
that light would shine and you would see reflections, right? You would see like microorganisms, plankton, like looking like dust specks and your light would shine on those. And you would see the reflection of the light on those little particles. That's the mirrored universe of who you are being reflected back to you. But it's also like the beacon. It's also how you are navigating the field to then pull to you with that feminine seduction of the subconscious mind, what you want to experience. So it's literally us creating our entire reality on the inside and the outside. Before we move on to some of the practical stuff, we're doing so good on time. Oh my God, I'm so happy. Um, what I want to say is that the, um, I know for me, like when I first heard we create our reality, we're the ones who are doing it. I had that reaction of like, well, fuck you. I'm not creating this. I don't want this. But the stuff that is creating our reality is so old. Dr. John Sarno's work of the divided mind where I learned how I had my psychosomatic injury talks about early child primitive. And in his book, he actually says zero to seven. So from zero to seven, in theory, could mean he talks about zero as in being in your mother's womb, but it goes back even further than that because our chemicals that we have in our body and our vibration that we have in our body come from the egg that was inside of our mom's ovary when she was a baby inside your grandma. And so this stuff, this is how we get into the lineage work and the ancestry work, because whatever we're linked through our grandmothers on that chemical level and the vibrational level. So if we have like these struggles in our life where we're like, I don't know where this is coming from. I don't know why I'm having these issues. I've done therapy. I've done inner work. I've done all these things. It could be that it's that deep that it's not even having anything to do with you. It just got stored in your body through the environment. And I'll share with you like how we get through it, but like it is our body and our mind that's creating all of this, but it's not like our fault. And it's not something that we deserved or like, um, our, um, you know, once you know about it and you want to make changes, right? It's your responsibility, but it's not necessarily your fault if if we're struggling with stuff that's really deep. Okay. So um, the exercises I'm going to share with you are going to be so that you can get your goals met. When we commit to, attachment theory is coming up. When we commit to changing our body, we are going to pull up all of our inner child and our inner teenage problems. So our inner child of like not wanting to follow, well, both of them, and like there's no like black and white scenario here, but we're gonna face all of the patterns that we learned to avoid pain. And so these exercises are gonna be what's gonna make your body happen but also making the decision to do the exercises are going to pull up the emotions. The molecules of emotion are going to start to move. You're going to have them release and send a signal to your brain. And then you're going to have thoughts that maybe you didn't remember. You're going to have meanings in your body of elation. Or, you know, when you feel like um, you can't do the exercise, you might feel the disempowering memories that you have. The process of moving your body is what's going to allow you to access a lot of this unconscious stuff that hasn't been resolved for you yet, as evidenced by how you feel in your body and its performance and how you feel about yourself and about your body. So the muscles that are to build a strong and healthy body are compound movements. Now you don't have to use barbells. Um, it's just, this is the best depiction of it. But when we do a compound move, that means that we're moving multiple joints at once. And our muscles attach at joints and on the bone. So when we do something that is a multi-joint function, like a squat, 
is your ankles, your knees, your hips, but the energy is like held and braced through your spine and your shoulders. Like that's like the non-moving part, but the multi-joint function is in the legs. The legs have a multi, have a meaning about being sturdy and being grounded. So you're going to pull up insecurities as you work on your lower body. I won't get into each thing, but basically when we have a multi-joint movement, a, a bench press, it could be with a dumbbell, it could be with a cable, it could be with a band. If you're pressing your arms, that means you're working your wrist, your elbow, your shoulders. Your deadlift is everything has to be engaged to pull that weight off the floor. So you're working ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, elbows, wrists, all of them, right? Like you get the idea. And so when we work these muscles more, we got more muscle, more balance, more coordination, the coordination comes from your joints and levers are like seesaws. So they have to organize and work together together to make the movement work. And so that recruitment of getting your body together on the physical level is also going to be doing something on the thought and feeling level. And then the real life function is that your movements get better. Like it's easier to like pick up heavy stuff or like in an awkward way. And then also you're with your metabolism, the more muscle you have, the, um, the more you get to eat. And, um, and also your body requires more energy to maintain the muscle. So you're going to be getting, um, a higher metabolic rate. Now for fat burning, we want to burn fat and preserve muscle. Your heart's a muscle. You want to keep as much muscle on your body as possible. So we do ladders, intervals, as many reps as possible, as many rounds as possible is usually what we will do for a high intensity interval training. And this is something that's like four to 12 minutes, maybe 15 minutes long. They're short and they are big bursts of energy. And then ideally enough time to let the heart rate go down. So what you're doing is like sending this huge energetic signal. You're getting oxygen flowing really quickly. The heart rate's going up. So your cardiovascular system, your blood's getting cleaned. Your brain is going to have more oxygen in it. But ideally these things are when you're doing an interval that you have enough time to let your heart rate go down so that you actually get the interval action in your body, like a sprinter, like just look at a sprinter and look at a runner. Which one do you want to look like? The ladders is where you're like setting a timer for 10 minutes and you're like, okay, I'm going to do three exercises. The first round, I'm going to do 10 reps, then eight, then six, then four, then two. And so you end up going faster through the movement and you try to get it done as quickly as you can. So maybe that exercise session is only seven and a half minutes, but you worked your ass off. And psychologically, it's way fun to like have those, those reps get trimmed down um, as many reps as possible. So say you set a timer for five, for five minutes and you're like, I'm going to do a hundred reps of squats and I'm just going to get them done as quickly as I can. That might mean that you do all hundred in one thing, or like you do 25 and then you do 36 and you just like trying to get it done as quickly as you can. As many rounds as possible, same thing. If you had three exercises and you set a timer for 10 minutes, you're going to try to do as many rounds through those three exercises as you possibly can before that timer runs out. And that's really going to help you um, get all the things on the list. I'm not going to read all of the lists right here, but you get the idea. Okay. This is the one that I left out. I can't believe I left it out because I remember when I realized what this was, I was like, oh my God, I've been literally working on this my whole life. So Pilates Barbell Club um, is a, is was my gym and we did a main strength exercise. So one of those compound lifts, then we did high intensity. Well, we did accessory work to make sure that we supported the muscles that did that compound lift. Then we did high intensity interval training. Then we did the seven mat Pilates exercises <laughs> for the transverse plane. And the reason why at the time was I was researching the bodybuilding or the strength training community and the Pilates community. And the only thing that those two communities agreed on was that a, um, a dynamic stretch, meaning one part of your body stays still while the other part stretches. So your body kind of becomes a piece of equipment as the resistance 
that that was the number one way to do stretching, dynamic stretching and Pilates meets that criteria. The other thing that maybe the, the Pilates community didn't talk about it, but like the physiotherapy, physical therapy type community um, agreed on that the, the plane of motion that people got injured the most was twisting and bending sideways. The injuries don't mostly happen going forward and backward. It's side to side and twisting. So I was like, let me look through the Pilates, Matt Pilates, and see what are the seven, ex what exercises are for that. So it ended up being seven. And I was like, oh, five by seven, PVC five by seven. We do a strength training. We do the accessory. We do the hit. We do Pilates. 45 minutes, we have all our bases covered and it was genius and it worked really well. And I had a full gym of women and it was really fantastic. So the light body connection part of it is the person that's on the profile with the pink line, our gallbladder meridian. I laugh because I'm just like, is this for real? This is for real. You guys, the gallbladder meridian line is the meridian line energetically that like sandwiches you with your light body. So there's, um, there are some scary spiritual things out there that this is like the dimensional, <sighs> just sounds so crazy. This is the dimensional wall that not great things come through into manifestation to the physical world. And I'm not saying that to scare you, but like, like, um, if you look at stranger things and you have the wall going to the fourth dimension where the evil guy is, that's kind of the gallbladder meridian line. But it's also something that you can work with and control and heal. And so when I learn the spiritual stuff and I go to my acupuncturist and I go to my chiropractor and we talk about these things, I'm like, oh my God, um, because I had a spiritual experience with the gall gallbladder mer mer meridian line where I did um, a healing practice on myself. And then when I checked in with, um, a person who was mentoring me and I described to her what happened. She was like, Oh, this is your, this is your ability. This is what that was. This is what it represents. Good job. So, um, we don't need to get into it, but basically there's evidence out there that you can research and find it on the internet. Um, that this is what we're doing with the sagittal. I think it's called the sagittal plane. So, um, those are those exercises. Now let's get into, um, the, the mind. Um, I was looking at the time and got distracted. I'm like, oh my God, Darlene, are you okay on time? You're fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Cause this is important stuff. Like I'm literally giving you guys everything. Like this is, this is it. Like I'm, I'm not holding anything back. I'm trying to tell you all the things that I've learned. So we're going to go over these ways so that you can really listen to your body. The first one is the deprivation to indulgence scale. So that's the top graphic there. And our goal is to stay in the middle where we are satisfied. And what this means is that we don't go into deprivation where we're in too much of a calorie cut or we're taking out our favorite foods to then where we go to an event like a barbecue or we go to a wedding or we go on vacation or you just get to the weekend and you're just like, holy shit, like I need to eat all my favorite things because that swinging back and forth really wrecks, wrecks our metabolism. And either way you look at it, this is stress. And so what I'm sharing with you here is really kind of about stress reduction so that we're not using food to reduce our stress. So when we want it, we, what we're trying to do is what we call navigating the middle where you're always satisfied, where if someone were to offer you a buffet of your favorite food and you would normally have the urge to be like, oh my God, I'm never going to have this again. Like this is a special occasion and da, 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 da. you're like, I'm good. Like you either don't even touch it because you're so satisfied leading up to that offer, or you have a little bit of it because you're, you're literally good. Like you, like it's, it tastes good, but you know, you don't have that urge that you need to overdo it. Another thing to do is to eat to 80% fullness. So this 80% fullness is such an easy way to be in a slight calorie deficit where your physiology, so your body and your psychology, your mind don't really notice that it's in a deficit. So then you don't have any of these alarm bells going off in your body on a primal level that says, oh my God, I need to eat. 
So eating to 80% fullness is such an easy way to trim a few calories every single day so that you can have a slow fat loss process. Then we have preemptive cheats. So the preemptive cheat is where you are going to have a little bit of your favorite food every day, maybe even multiple times a day. So that again, you never get to a point where you're deprived. Now, I started implementing these things in March when I stopped tracking macros and stopped dealing with inflammation. And basically I got to eat whatever I wanted without any symptoms. And it was very challenging to control it because there's a boomerang effect of being uh, deprived because I was deprived with that eating list um, to how far you're going to indulge. So I was eating a lot of chocolate and a lot of wine and I've reined it back in to like feel the moderation approach. And one of the things that I've been doing is I have all different flavors of protein bars so that I could feel like I'm eating sweets and I just take a little bite and put it back in the fridge and then take a little bite and put it back in the fridge. And then my neighbor is an amazing baker. And so she gave me frozen chocolate chip cookie dough balls. So I have two balls left and I take a bite, just a bite. Last night, I think I had three bites of one of the balls, but it's like, these are the things that I really love. And so I'm eating them a little bit all the time and I feel much better. I don't feel as stressed of like, how am I going to navigate this now that I don't have any restriction? Then we have the richness to volume scale. And so this is an inner dialogue with, with yourself. And so that's the bottom image. So what you want to think about is, am I more of someone who really likes rich, fatty food that's a little bit more calorie dense? Or am I someone who really enjoys volume where I need a lot of roughage? I like to have a full stomach feeling. Because if you think about it, if you're more richness, you're not getting a lot of volume because there's so many calories in it. It's dense. It's like muscle. It's dense. The roughage end of it, like it, even if it, you know you're like rice and potatoes and and vegetables and stuff, that's more of a volume experience where it's going to take you longer to eat something, and it's less calories, so you might even be hungrier sooner. Or either way, like it's it is who it is for who you are. But when we make this kind of analysis and we have this image in our head, then when we're going to make decisions with our food and not being on a quote unquote diet, we can check in and be like, what do I really want? Because there's so many food rules that are contradictive. So it's like, instead of having a rule in your head that says you can't have this, it's like, well, why? You know, like the other day we had my mom and I at lunch, we had, um, we split a package of uh, cheese and salami. I had a whole bunch of carrots she got some antipasta. It was like full of oil and like feta cheese and different peppers that were like mini peppers and olives. And then we had, um, rosemary raisin flaxseed crackers. And that was lunch four months ago. Right. So I started this in, in, in March. If I had, if I had gone to eat that and I had the rules, I'd be like, oh my God, this is way too much fat in one sitting. But I'm like, I actually know that I'm more of a fat person. I love fat. So I ate it and I was like, God, I feel fucking good. And then like uh, when nighttime came around, like I didn't feel an urge to like graze on anything delicious because I was like literally good. I was like, oh my God, I'm saying it. I'm saying I'm good. Like, this is great. So you want to think about that. Like, this is just stuff that you have in your mind as a thought process to kind of like slow down that experience when you're choosing your food. Okay. So this is where you really start to find your patterns when you commit to habit change. So just an overview. If we don't have people taking care of our baby body, we die. End of story. This is um, a, a branch of psychology that's really talking about what's going on in the ages of zero to seven. And there's a myriad of, uh, there's like a spectrum in between all of this of the styles um, between extreme anxiety and avoidance. So in short, when what I believe how this translates to the body is that when we are anxious, we're attached to the outcome of the result. And so then we get really obsessive on the tools. So in the relationship wise, this is when like people are like, 
the example a lot of times that's given is when you're anxiously attached to the person, if they don't text you back right away, like within five minutes, you automatically assume they've lost interest and they're cheating on you and it's all over. And so then we're like super fucking needy to make sure that that person is validating us. So for me, when I, and I have both of these attachment styles. And so when I saw how this was showing up and how I had destroyed my body with the tools, with laxatives and diet pills and working out too much, and then being so extreme to where I couldn't keep up with it and then sabotage and then eat everything in sight, like, hello. So, um, this is how I see it, where we're, where, where the anxiety is coming from, we need that body to give us the validation of love because we're really looking for love. And the avoidant style is how I was extremely avoidant of myself, which is why all of my emotional and inner work was like, I say it's like from the back end, like how I was saying, I would look up the meanings of these areas of the body to find it. So the avoidant is really that you are not able to give yourself love. And so this is where our mind will start to create the reality outside of ourself that doesn't let us put ourselves first. And so this is like a lot of busyness and a lot of demands from other people. And it's also where in the relationship side of, of the avoidant, it's where you find the person, you feel like you're falling in love. And everything is going great. And then all of a sudden, a little thing in your brain goes off and says, there's probably someone better. This was really easy. Or we start. And, and so what happens is when that alarm goes off, like you're feeling good. And the fear is I'm going to be disconnected from this person. So the action is I'm going to, I'm going to push this person away or I'm going to leave first. So I don't get hurt. So then this is where we subconsciously start to get a busier schedule where we can't meet up with the person or we start to think this was too easy. There's probably someone better out there. And when we do this with the body, what's happening is this is where we diet hop and we program hop because we get the high of starting a new endeavor and we, we probably will start to get results. And then when we get the results, we're like, oh, but this was too easy. Or this wasn't working for me. And fuck the system and fuck dieting. I'm perfect the way I am. And then you like stop following through. So I've really noticed these things. And like I said, my friends who do attachment theory for relationships, they're like, oh my God, this is exactly right. This is so, this is like genius, like so good. So these are the things that I worked on for myself. And, um, Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Screenshot the next slides. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because this is, because since this is free, I'm not making any deliverables of like, um, you know, what is it called? A PDF, because this is a free experience. So this is where you can start to like really reflect on where your patterns are. And I have the wheel of life there because when you can look at where these patterns might be showing up in the wheel of life, what will happen, it's the best part, energetically, you're going to start to create that space with how it's showing up with your body, with its health and performance. And then also it's this aesthetic and how you feel about yourself because of your body. So if you start to zone, if you start to scope out and you actually start to see where this is showing up in your life, the habit change becomes easier because you're more aware of those subconscious patterns that are preventing your follow through or causing your sabotage. So this is stuff that you'll be able to use later. Um, like I said, I'm literally giving you everything right now. Okay, this is the workshop time. We are back. If you were not here on the live recording, you missed the live workshopping where we went into some coaching. And so now I'm going to share with you um, how you can deepen this information if you're watching this on the replay or if you are here live. So the next phase of this power moves of how you can really get into this is liftoff. And so liftoff is four weeks where we are going to deepen all the information that you just learned. So mindsets, what they are and how to dismantle destructive ones and build constructive ones. We're going into two parts of the emotion, how to change your mind body identity. So that's below the skin and then how to change your body to reality experience that's outside the skin. 
And then the second part of the emotional work is the meaning aspect of it. So we know that they're working functionally to create our physical experience and our physical reality, but emotions have meaning. And so I'm going to take you through a process so that you can rewrite painful stories and bring them into peace and pleasure. Um, because uh, what is it called? Spoiler alert. Our mindsets are based on the remembrance of pain or the avoidance of pain. So I'm going to help you dismantle a couple of the strong mindsets um, that are keeping our body not the way we want it. And then also habit change. So we're going to really go deep into how your attachment patterns are so that you can reshape your body and then rearrange your environment so that it's going to be a supportive environment to your new body. And then we're also going deeper into exercises. So you're going to have information and resources to actually bring yourself through strength training, HIT, and Pilates workouts, my Pilates Barbell Club workouts that are going to be all laid out for you in a step-by-step -step process. So the content delivery, we're going to have pre-recorded trainings plus workbooks. So you're going to have deliverable PDFs. You're going to have exclusive YouTube playlists that are only there for you. Nobody else will have access to it. We're going to have live group coaching calls so that you can really deepen the understanding of all of the information. And then lifetime access to lift off July 2023 of the Facebook community. And um, I don't know how many times I'm going to run this program. And so that's why... We've got that lift off July, 2023. So you'll have access to all of this forever so that you can always refer back to it. And that's where you're going to have like links to the calls, um, the PDFs, the replays. It's all going to be organized right there for you. Um, if you're watching the replay, you got to the replay on purpose. This was meant for you to listen to and to absorb, and you don't have to sign up with me. You got all of the information. I did not hold anything back, and you can just deepen that. You can go through this on YouTube, take screenshots, use them as journal prompts, look up some of the people that I cited. If you want to do liftoff where it's four weeks, that's fantastic. I look forward to getting a message from you either on a DM or or an email or a private Facebook message, whatever the information to contact me is in the, um, is in the description. And um, if not, we'll see you for another live training.